Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 18 to 24. This is actually going to be our reading for the next five weeks. Uh, We're going to have this every Sunday. Uh, Give thanks that I didn't make this the memory verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. And if even an animal touches the mound, it must be stoned. And the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm terrified and trembling. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus mediator of a new covenant and of the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to spend a bit of time uh, looking at that passage and the other passages we saw, uh, we heard, uh, Deuteronomy 4 and Exodus 19. Uh, There's a sermon outline there on the inside uh, of your uh, service booklet, your newsletter, household questions for discussion over lunch, Uh, God willing, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the sermon. Uh, Imagine that you rock up for work on Tuesday, because let me remind you, tomorrow's a public holiday. Uh, You rock up for work on Tuesday and someone asks you, what's church? Why do you do those things at church? What do you do at church? Why do you do those things and not other things? What makes church more important than the pony club or the football club? Who makes up the church? Who creates the church? Do you actually really need to go to church to be a Christian? What's church? Well, besides being dumbfounded, there'd be good questions to be asked, wouldn't they, on a Tuesday morning? Given the fact that we do this every Sunday, uh, what would our answers be to those questions? Uh, They're big questions, aren't they? They're important questions. They're questions which, if we spend time in God's word, we'll have answered in such a way that we have an explanation for why we do this. And not only why we do this, but why we do other stuff from Monday through to Saturday. Our answers to those questions not only explain what we do together, they also help us have an understanding of what we do individually. Over the next five weeks, we're going to do a short series on church. You've got all the questions there on your preaching postcard. And in many ways, what we're going to be doing now is a taster, an introduction to thinking about church. God willing, our thinking won't be finalised. God willing, we'll keep thinking about many questions we have about church. And I'm pretty confident that I've missed some really important areas along the way. But over the next five weeks, we're going to think about those questions about church. And the aim of the series is really very simple. There are three aims. First, what does the Bible say about church? Not what my favourite Christian author says, not what I was taught in the past, but what does the Bible say? And so we're going to be spending a lot of time in God's Word and we're going to be jumping around in it. Second, we want to sharpen our definitions. We want to get our answers clearer. We want to get our answers under God's word, submitted to what he says in his word. And thirdly, we want to think about the consequences, not only for what we do here, but for what we do Monday through to Saturday. So let me pray, and we're going to dive into the question of what is church. Father, thanks for your word. I thanks that we can read it. Thank you that we can gather at the start of a new year, doing something we've done almost every week for the last umpteen years. As we open your word, help us to think clearly about church from your word, what it is, who it is, who makes it, who builds it, what we do here and why we do it. Father, please transform us by your word. 
to reflect you more fully as we gather as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Let me be right up front, and this is a content warning. This is probably going to be the densest of the five sermons. That's why I've put it at the start. So we're going to spend a lot of time looking at some big concepts today, and we're going to really stretch our brains over the next 20 minutes. One way we could understand the idea of church is to look at the word church in the Bible. Uh, Our word church comes from German and Latin, and it is from a, a Greek phrase that means God's house or the Lord's house. It picks up one of those images that we use pretty much every Sunday. We're God's household. But what about the word that our English word translates? Uh, You'll see it there on your sermon outline. Uh, It's the Greek word ecclesia. Uh, Literally, it means assembly. It means assembly. Uh, Literally, it means the group of voting adults that made decisions in a city. And they always gathered together. It's the assembly of all the people who had a say in the running of the town. It's your old school town hall meeting in one place at one time. And if you weren't there, you didn't get a proxy vote. You had to be there to be part of the ecclesia. And we get that word a number of times in the New Testament. But one of the most interesting is in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, verse 32. We're in the city of Ephesus. And Paul has been preaching the good news about Jesus and it's caused the bottom of the market to drop out in the selling of idols. And so all the town's tradesmen get together and they call the assembly. And this is a description. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another, because the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they'd come together. That's the ecclesia in that town. Gathered together. It sounds a little like question time, doesn't it, in Parliament? But that's the assembly gathered in one place to discuss, to debate, to find out. It's the word used right throughout the New Testament to refer to church. And it's the case that happens right throughout the New Testament that the authors grab words from the common culture and reuse them, give them a bigger meaning. Uh, If you like a good translation of the word church, there would be mob, wouldn't it? (laughs) All gathered together, yelling, shouting, "Who? why are we here? But that's the word used throughout the New Testament for church, the ecclesia, the voting adult population in one place at one time. Now, we could look at that right throughout the New Testament. I'm at point three on the outline. Uh, It's used first in Matthew 16 by Jesus. It's used twice more by him in Matthew 18. Or we could go to look at Acts chapter 5, where we have it attached to the meeting of the first group of early Christians. We could go to the book of Revelation and see what it looks like forever in heaven where God is. We could go to any one of Paul's letters. We've done that in Ephesians and Colossians. But I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 12. I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 12. And so please turn with me to Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 24. And we're going to spend a bit of time bouncing in and out of this passage. Now, I've chosen this passage because I think it gives us the best understanding of church across the whole Bible. The word church is only used once. It's there in verse 23, the assembly. But I think this passage helps us see what the church was what the church will be so that we know what it is now. This passage helps us see what the church was, what the church will be, so that we understand what the church is now. Look at verse 18. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. And if even an animal touches a mountain, it must be stoned. And the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Hebrews is a very simple book. It's all about why Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That's the whole point of Hebrews. And in these four verses, 
we're given a glance back at the first use of church in the whole Bible. We're given a glance back to when God's mob became God's mob in Deuteronomy chapter 4. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. That's page 154 in your pew Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 4. It was one of the readings that Lynn brought us earlier. As you turn there, Deuteronomy is three sermons by Moses. God's people are about to go into the promised land. Moses isn't going. He wants to talk to them about what they need to remember as they go into the land God promised. He wants to remind them of who they are and what God has said to them. And in Deuteronomy 4, Moses takes them back to the moment they became God's mob. If you like, this is a trip to Tenerfield to hear about federation. Moses wants to take them back to Mount Sinai, to Horeb. God had already saved them, hadn't he? Remember the Exodus? God had already brought them to this place in his mercy and kindness. God had already fulfilled his promise to them and now he gave them the revelation of his character, the Ten Commandments, so they could know how to reflect him to the world. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10. The day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, Moses, assemble the people before me and I'll let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and may instruct their children. You came near and stood at the base of the mountain, a mountain blazing with fire into the heavens, enveloped in a dense black cloud. Then the Lord spoke to you from the fire. You kept hearing the sound of the words, but you didn't see a form. There was only a voice. He declared his covenant to you. He commanded you to follow the Ten Commandments, which he wrote on two stone tablets. And at that time, the Lord commanded me to teach you the statutes and ordinances for you to follow in the land you're about to cross into and possess. And see the similarity with Hebrews chapter 12, the description the writer of the Hebrews wants you to go back there. But when we look at Deuteronomy 4, I want you to notice two really important things. The way Moses speaks says that the people in front of him were at Mount Sinai. But you know what? None of them were as adults, were they? That was 50 years ago, 40 years at the earliest. None of them were actually there. But Moses speaks in a way to say that you actually were there because you're part of the mob. What happened there applies to you. Isn't that remarkable? That'll be really important when we come back to Hebrews. I want you to notice too in verse 10 there, do you see the word assemble or gather? That's the word for church, ecclesia, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This is the first time that word is used in the whole Bible. And we're meant to go, they're churchy. That's what they did at Mount Sinai. They had church up there at that mountain. Now, what really took place on that day? Oh, come with me to Exodus 19. So go back towards the front of your Bible. Uh, I think it's page 63 in your pew Bibles. This is the other reading that Lynn brought us. And this is the original account of the first church. And we're not going to read the whole passage again. But I want to draw out the four things that seem to characterise church right throughout the Bible. Uh, first, in verses 3 to 6, this passage is unmistakably about God's people. Do you see that there in verse 5? They're God's possession out of all the peoples of the earth. Verse 6, they're his kingdom of priests and my holy nation. The people at the first church are God's mob. God's rescued them. God's claimed them. God has made them his people. The second thing we need to notice is that they're gathered, aren't they? I look there in verses 1, 2, and 3. They're in a particular place at one moment. They're not scattered, are they? They're not all over the place. Part of their churching is that they're in one place at one time. It's not some airy-fairy spiritual relationship across time. No, church is there in one place at one moment. Thirdly, the passage makes clear that God himself has gathered them. Look there in verse 4. 
You've seen how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. God is the one that brings them all together. And at the heart of their time together is God's word, isn't it? Did you notice that? God spoke to them. Moses went down and communicated all those words, verse 7. And then God wrote them down. And fourthly, they were gathered together to do no other thing except to meet with God. Do you notice that? It's just God and his mob, plural, together in one place at one moment. So here are the four parts of church that we see right throughout the Bible consistently. It is of God's people in one physical place at one time by God to meet God. Let me say that again. It is of God's people in one physical place at one time by God to meet with God. But I hope you notice the vibe. Never thought I'd use that word in a sermon, but I seem to be using it more and more. I hope you notice the vibe of the first church. You couldn't miss it from Hebrews 12. It's a moment of great fear and terror, isn't it? Did you notice that? People are petrified. When was the last time you woke up and were petrified about going to church? They are scared witless. Even the great friend of God, Moses, is petrified, isn't he? Remember that from Hebrews 12? This is church filled with fear and terror and awe. Why would that be the case? Well, these people remember one very important fact about themselves, don't they? They don't deserve to be there. They don't deserve to be there. You've got God, perfect, sinless, unique, the most significant one in the whole world, and you've got a whole bunch of pretenders who want his throne. And they know that for them to come into his presence is to invite certain death if they do it in their own natural state. They're at church, but there's a whopping great big elephant in the room, isn't there? And it's called sin. And that's why this first church is wonderfully and awesomely terrifying. That is church at the beginning. Come back with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And we're now going to look at what church is in the future. Remember what I said Hebrews 12 was about? What church is then? What church is then? So we know what church is like now. And I want you to jump with me to Hebrews 12 verse 22, page 1069. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. It's a very different vibe, isn't it? It's a very different vibe. But I want you to see the common threads with church in the future and church at Mount Sinai. Do you notice that church here is full of God's people? The firstborn, those whom God has made his own, those who are righteous, those whom are God's people. That's the same as at Mount Sinai, isn't it? Do you notice here that church is gathered in one place at one time? Now, time's a long time, it's eternity, but it's one place, isn't it? It's the new Jerusalem. It's the city of God on a mountain far greater than Sinai, but still one place and one time, just like at Mount Sinai. Do you notice that this church is gathered by God to God who is the judge of all? No one comes into his city unless he opens the gate. No one comes into his presence unless he calls them in. It's the same as at Mount Sinai, isn't it? And do you notice that this church is around God and with God? 
This is a group of people, God's people, meeting with God himself. All the same ideas as in that first church, the same four features, church then and church then. But I want you to notice two very important differences. There's no fear or trembling, is there? There's no terror. Church then, in heaven, because that's what it is a description of, church then has no fear. Not in the sense of terror. And the answer can only be because that elephant in the room has been dealt with. Because sin has been dealt with. And we're going to look at that next week. I also want you to notice, secondly, in verses 18 to 24, that there are only two verbs. You have not come, verse 18. You have come. Same verb. Same verb. It's plural. This isn't a bunch of individuals. This is a mob coming together. And I want you to notice the tense. What's the tense? You have come. You have come. It's already happened. Now, that is something that is really hard to get our brains around. It's already taken place. Uh, simply, it means at least this, what Jesus has done is so good, so definite, so final, so perfect, so reassuring that what you are going to have forever is as good as already done. It's as good as already done. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, you're already suited in the heavenlies. You're already dwelling with God. What we will do forever is already happening now. Did you think about that as you ate your wheat this morning and prepared to come to church? What you are doing now is a reflection of what you are doing forever. It's as good as already done. That's pretty significant, isn't it? That's pretty significant. Church now reflects what church will be forever and is the bigger, better version of what church was there on Mount Sinai. So let's go back to our original question. I'm at point four on the outline. What is church? Now, we've covered a huge amount of the Bible, haven't we? What is church? Well, we've seen that church then and church then both have the same four characteristics. We've seen that there's a difference. The vibe then was one of terror and fear. The vibe then is one of joyful coming into the presence of God. We've seen that the difference is, and we'll look at this more fully next week, sin has been dealt with. So wrapping all of those things up, if you look at your outline at point four, you'll see a definition for church. Church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place at one time, by God, around God, with God. That's what church is across the whole of the Bible. Now, that'll lead to certain consequences, and you'll see on your outline there that I want to finish with five very simple observations. Some of these will have a sharp edge. Some of these will cause us to think. I hope they do. I've been rethinking these things this week as I've looked at this passage and other passages and read some other stuff. But let me begin with the first observation. Church is the meeting of God's people with God by God. If what we are doing in heaven forever is what we are doing now, if that's our template, church is for God's mob. Did you hear that very carefully? Church is for God's people. Think about the consequences of that. Think about the consequences of that. Oh, one way you could think about the consequences of that are to maybe ask a question like this. Are there any non-Christians in heaven? Well, if that's our template then it helps us understand why we do church now. Now, let me be very clear. This is not what I'm saying. Okay? I'm not saying that non-Christians are not welcome at church. 
But the purpose of church is primarily throughout the Bible for God's people. Time and time again. Whatever we do at church, and we're going to look at this in the fifth sermon, whatever we do at church must be intelligible to anyone who walks through the door. We must use language that they're familiar with. We must explain what we're doing. It must be welcoming and hospitable. But church itself is the gathering of God's mob. So when we think about what we do, that's our motivation. Second observation. Church here reflects church there. That is a very important thing to think about every time we gather. What we are doing now is a reflection of what we will be doing forever, in eternity. To come into the presence of the living God is a serious joy. It's serious because we know we can't come into his presence on our own two feet. It's a joy because we can come into his presence. I want us to keep capturing that. Everything we do here as we gather, as a mob, reflects what we will do there. Third observation. Church is a must for Christians. Church is a must for Christians. Again, you could ask this pragmatically, and this was a question that was asked of me by an older, wiser Christian. What makes us think we will do church forever with God if we give it a low priority now? Church is more important as a community event than any other communal activity, isn't it? than any other sporting club, than any other hobby. Church, the gathering of God's people, is a great opportunity to witness to family who are visiting. What we do now is what we say we'll be doing forever. So let's commit. (laughs) Week in, week out. That's why the Bible's images of church are always about things that work when they're together. (laughs) Do you notice that? This pinky woke up this morning and said, I don't want to go to church. I'm just going to hop off and live on my own. Well, if that pinky separates itself from this body, what is it? It's dead flesh, isn't it? It's not part of the body. Observation four, church exists when God's people are gathered. Uh, This is a really hard one for us to think about, but right throughout the Bible, whenever the word church, ecclesia, is used and whenever the images of church are used, it describes when they're gathered together as God's people. It describes when they're gathered together as God's people. On this earth, church doesn't exist when God's people are not gathered. The only universal church is in heaven. So this is helpful for someone like me who works under a label. The Anglican denomination is not a church. It's an organisational structure. (laughs) It means that church on earth is intermittent. It happens when we gather, all of us, in one place, at one time, by God, to meet with God which means our last observation is important. Church is more verb than noun. Here's, we've learned a Greek word today. Uh, let's do a quick reminder of grammar. Verbs are doing words. Nouns are naming words, aren't they? That's simple. That's what an art student understands. Church is about gathering. Church is a verbal idea. It's a gathering concept in one place at one time. That means, very importantly, that church is not the people of God. It's what the people of God do. Because when you go out the door, what are you? You're all individual people of God, aren't you? And that has very serious consequences for other activities. Look through the Bible and see who's responsible for evangelism. Church is not God's kingdom. God's kingdom is where God's rule is exercised, and church is one expression of that. And that has important consequences for how we deal with social issues. 
and how we deal with what comes up in the media. So there you go, our first question, what is church? We've covered a lot, haven't we? Hebrews 12, Deuteronomy 4, Exodus 19, five observations, some hard questions, some new ideas. But let me finish reminding us of the answer to our question. What is church? Church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place at one time, by God, around God, with God. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Your word is both a balm for our soul and a scalpel for our hearts. Father, thank you that in your word is the great truth that we can be brought into your presence. A Father, to meditate on that, to ponder that, unfolds a huge amount of wonder that a rebel, a someone who seeks your throne, a, a person who wants your crown, can be brought into your presence because you deal with our rebellion. Father, that is a great comfort for our soul. Father, there is also exposure in your word. And Father, our hearts are opened and our desires exposed. Father, as we've looked at what your word briefly says about church, our lack of commitment might be confronted. Uh, Our apathy might be exposed. Father, please, by your spirit, enliven us to see anew in your revelation what it means to be part of your mob, your community, your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Nita. Yeah, so Anita's asked a really important question. Uh, God's body, the church and mob, are they the same idea in the household? They're all the same package, different ways of describing it. Uh, One of the really important things to capture in the Bible is that we have very clear statements about church and then we have imagery about church and the two go hand in hand. We're not dealing with much of the imagery in this sermon series. But you have a number of images, don't you? You have household, you have bride, you have vine, you have building, you have fortress and pillar and bulwark, okay? They're all images, metaphors for church. Church as a word can be translated across a number of areas. So the Acts 19.32, that's a mob. It's a bunch of wild people gathered together. That could sometimes be our gatherings on a Sunday, can't it? But then it can be the other extreme, which is just a a group of people gathered together, as we see in 1 Corinthians, very orderly. But they're all talking about the same thing, the gathering of God's people. Yeah, does that answer your question? Second question. Yep. Christians across the world, how do you describe them? They're the people of God who gather. And so when we pray or when we state that we believe in the universal church, which creed's that in? Can anyone remember? Nicene and the Apostolic, uh, the the Apostles' Creed. Uh, We are praying not about what happens here but what God will do forever (laughs) because that's the only universal church. All of God's people in one place, that's heaven. All of God's people around the world are the people of God who meet sporadically, once a week on a Sunday, and when they meet, that's church, reflecting what we'll do forever. So there are other churches meeting in Narrabri today who hold on to the truth, aren't there? That's as much a reflection of heaven as what we are now. Does that answer that question? And one more question, via technology. It is. What does that mean Yeah, it's it's a really important question. What does that mean for the last two years of church? Uh, It's a question I'm struggling to get my brain around. Uh, Church in the Bible is the one people gathered in one place. And so I think in a broken world, under the circumstances that we've experienced, gathering in households can be a reflection of that but it's not the ideal. 
So the ideal is us all gathered together. We've got the live stream going at the moment for reasons of illness, uh, for other reasons. Some people can't be with us. They're reflecting the heavenly household as they gather in their own households, but it's not the ideal. Okay, And we know that, don't we? We know when we miss church on a Sunday because we're sick or because we're out of town. You'd like to go to another church, wouldn't you? Or you've just missed gathering with God's people. So the last few years has not been the ideal, which is why we're moving back to pushing away the live stream and encouraging us all to meet together, aren't we, in what we can.